Art in its own is great, but when you mix two types of art together, that can even become greater. Not only because of the amalgamation of those two types of art, but also the support one gives to the other. And that is exactly what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Celia Thaxter and Child Hassam. Maybe you've heard of these two people, maybe you haven't, but you will definitely know who these two people are in today's Word Power episode as we're going to talk about their story and we're going to learn 10 new words in context. Let me tell you about the words we're going to learn in today's context. We're going to learn collaboration, profusion, distill, evanescent, gravitate, muse, render, somber, hybrid, and scintillating. So, are you interested? Of course, you are. We're going to talk about Celia Thaxter and Child Hassam in today's Word Power episode. 10 new words in context, and this is your host, Danny, and this is a new episode from English Plus Podcast. Now, before we start, let me remind you that you can practice every single thing you're going to learn in this episode in a custom post I created on my website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. You can find the link in the show notes, take the link after you listen to the episode, and go to this post to practice every word that you're going to learn in this episode because that's the only way you're going to add these words to your active vocabulary bank. While listening to the episode on its own is going to help you, of course, it's going to add these words to your passive vocabulary bank. You're going to understand these words, but you're going to find problems remembering these words in the long run, and you're going to find even more problems trying to use these words in your own language, in your own writing and speaking. And that's the whole point of word power, right? We want to turn these words into part of your active vocabulary bank. So don't waste this opportunity and take this link you can find find in the show notes, go to my website, go to this custom post I created. You will find exercises, both digital exercises, if you prefer to do exercises on your PC, tablet, or mobile phone. And there's also a PDF practice worksheet, if you prefer pen and paper, where you get to practice not only the 10 words you're going to learn in today's episode, but also you will have a chance to review the words you learned in the previous four Word Power episodes. And of course, I will remind you that there are premium episodes that I started creating last week. Now, of course, last week I was a little unwell and I didn't produce the number of premium episodes I promised. But this week we're going to have a premium episode for every single free episode you're going to listen to on English Plus Podcast. So don't miss this opportunity. The episodes are going to focus on vocabulary and speaking, grammar and speaking and business English. So they're going to be great if you want to take your English to the next level. All you have to do is to become a patron on Patreon and you will have access to all these episodes with all the exercises and activities that come with them. And of course, I will be there to answer any and all your questions. And if you really want to learn, you can contact me anytime you want and ask me any questions you want. I will always be there for you and I will always answer as soon as possible. So to unlock everything English Plus has to offer, you can become a patron on Patreon. The link is in the show notes. What are you waiting for? Take your English and learning to the next level with English Plus and with me, your host, Danny. And now let's not waste any more time and let's dive right in today's topic. We're going to talk about Celia Thaxter and Child Hassan. That's coming next. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. The Isles of Shoals which is a bleak cluster of rocks just off the main New Hampshire coast, are best known today as the site of one of America's notable artistic collaborations. It was here on Appledore Island that Celia Thaxter nurtured a wild profusion of blooms and from them distilled a lifetime of practical advice in her book An Island Garden. While Thaxter's evocations of joys and frustrations of cultivation set a standard for American garden writing that may never be surpassed, Child Hassam's illustrations of the garden's evanescent beauty are among America's finest contributions to Impressionism. When Hassam met Celia Thaxter in the early 1880s, Thaxter was already a well-known poet, and her book about growing up as the lighthouse keeper's daughter on the Isles of Shoals was a bestseller. 24 years Hassam senior, she enrolled in a watercolor class he was teaching in Boston. 
Their friendship blossomed when he and his wife gravitated to her family's hotel on Appledore. Thaxter became the young artist's devoted friend, muse, and mentor. At Thaxter's suggestion, he dropped his first name, Frederick, in favor of his more exotic middle name, Child. Child Hassam, inspired by his father's collection of art and antiques, began painting at an early age. By the time he was 20, his engravings and illustrations were appearing in leading publications. In 1883, determined to become a serious painter, he went on a European tour. In England, he responded to the masterful rendering of atmosphere in the landscapes of J.M.W. Turner, and in Paris, he embraced the sense of sunshine and fresh air portrayed by the Impressionists. Whether producing somber canvases of rainy Boston streets or animated oils of New York's Union Square, Hassam created a hybrid Impressionism, a sort of compromise between the careful drawing he had learned from engraving and the lush, bold feel of the modern French tradition. Celia Thaxter and Child Hassam had few American equals in their time. From Thaxter's accounts of individual plants to her scintillating description of her all-out war against slugs, she captured her garden's brilliant hues and her island's wild beauty. In a dazzling series of oils, watercolors, and pastels, Hassam recreated Thaxter's garden in vivid explosions of color ablaze among green foliage or against the gray rocks and blue skies of the New England summer. Celia Thaxter died in the summer of 1894, soon after the publication of An Island Garden. Hassam helped carry her to her island grave. Deeply moved by the loss of his friend, he stayed away from Appledore for several years. When he returned, he devoted his artistic attention to the island itself and the surrounding Atlantic. Thaxter's garden gradually disappeared, preserved only in her words and Hassam's works of art. Brilliant story, isn't it? Brilliant story of this great artistic collaboration between two great artists, Celia Thaxter and Child Hassam. So that was our story for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new from it. And now comes the time when we're going to learn 10 new words in context of our story today. Let me remind you again, these words are collaboration, profusion, distill, evanescent, gravitate, Muse, render, somber, hybrid, and scintillating. So, are you interested? Of course. Let's dive right in and let's start talking about the very first word for today's episode, which is collaboration. And as usual, I'm going to ask you a question first, give you a chance to guess the meaning on your own first, and then I will talk a little bit more about the words. So that's coming next. We're going to start talking about collaboration. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. So our very first word, C-O-L-L-A-B-O-R-A-T-I-O-N, collaboration. Let's remember how we use that in context. We said the Isles of Shoals, a bleak cluster of rocks just off the main New Hampshire coast, are best known today as the site of one of America's notable artistic collaborations. So when we talk about collaborations, how can you best explain collaborations in this context? Do you think it means critical points in time, joint efforts, obstacles to be overcome, or laws that are difficult to enforce? So, which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back to talk more about the word. Now, for those of you who thought joint efforts is the answer, you're absolutely right, because that's what collaboration is all about. Collaboration is the act of working together to produce a piece of work, especially a book or some research or some art, like in our example here. We can say, for example, that this work was a collaboration. A collaboration is a piece of work that has been produced as the result of people or groups working together. So it is not the work of an individual. It is the work of two or more people helping each other and usually yielding better results because of this collaboration. 
So that was our first word, collaboration. Very interesting word, very useful word that we can use in many different contexts. Now let's move on and talk about the next word, profusion. It is spelled P-R-O-F-U-S-I-O-N, profusion. Let's remember how we use that in context. We said, it was here on Appledore Island that Celia Thaxter nurtured a wild profusion of blooms and from them distilled a lifetime of practical advice in her book, An Island Garden. So that is our word, profusion, in this context. Now, my question is, which word or words could best replace profusion in this context? Could we replace it with conflict, brief involvement, expected condition, or abundance? Which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back to talk more about this word. Now, for those of you who thought abundance is the right answer, is the best word that could replace profusion in this context, you're absolutely right. If there is a profusion of something, or if it occurs in profusion, there is a very large quantity or variety of it. So we're talking about abundance, wealth, excess, quantity of something. That is the meaning of profusion. A very interesting word indeed. And now let's move on and talk about the next word, distill. D-I-S-T-I-L-L, distill. Let's remember how we use that in context. But it's actually the same context of the earlier word, but let me remind you again. It was here on Appledore Island that Celia Thaxter nurtured a wild profusion of blooms and from them distilled a lifetime of practical advice in her book, An Island Garden. So distilled a lifetime of practical advice. What does that mean? Which words do you think could best replace distilled in this context? Could we replace it with extracted the essential elements, moved about rapidly, bent repeatedly, or suspended indefinitely? Which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it. Maybe even pause the episode to think about it. But don't go away because I'll be right back with the answer and to talk a little bit more about this word. Now, for those of you who thought extracted the essential elements is the best answer, you're absolutely right, because that's the meaning of distill. Now, we use distill basically to talk about liquids such as whiskey or water. If a liquid such as whiskey or water is distilled, it is heated until it changes into steam or vapor and then cooled until it becomes liquid again. Well, this is usually done in order to make it pure. By doing that, you extract the essential elements, the best elements of this liquid to make it even better. Of course, in the case of whiskey, you want to make the purest possible to have the best quality possible. And in the case of water, you want to have the safest possible version of this water that you have. So you distill the water. But of course, here we're not talking about distilling whiskey or water, right? Here we're talking about thoughts. We're talking about ideas. So if a thought or idea is distilled from previous thoughts, ideas, or experiences, it comes from them. If it is distilled into something, it becomes part of that thing. And usually when you do that, you take the best parts. You take the essential parts and you put it. Just like when you want to write something. You don't want to just go ahead and write everything that comes to mind. You want to choose your words carefully because you want to keep the reader interested, not to drag on and on talking about some details the reader doesn't want to know about. You just want to keep the best elements, the best words, the best phrases. You want to extract the essential elements. That's the meaning of distill. So remember, this is a versatile word we can use in different contexts. In our context here, it definitely means to extract the essential elements of something. And that was our word distill, but that's not the last word. Of course, we have more. The next word is very special. It's evanescent. And by the way, the spelling of this word can be a little bit challenging. So pay attention to the spelling. It's E-V-A-N-E-S-C-E-N-T. Evanescent. But what does the word mean? First, of course, let's remember how we used it in context, and then we'll figure out the meaning of this word. While Thaxter's evocations of the joys and frustrations of cultivation set a standard for American garden writing that may never be surpassed, Child Hassam's illustrations of the garden's evanescent beauty are among America's finest contributions to Impressionism. 
So that is the context. So what do you think? Something that is evanescent can best be described as what? As effortless? As adapted from an original? As vanishing or likely to vanish? Or as artificial? Which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back to talk a little bit more about this word. Now, for those of you who thought vanishing or likely to vanish, you're absolutely right. That's the right answer. Something that is evanescent gradually disappears from sight or memory. And maybe that's why it is beautiful. I mean, maybe the best thing about our lives as humans is that it doesn't last forever because this way it has meaning. Every single second has a meaning. Every day has a meaning. But if we lived forever, it would mean nothing. We could do nothing for a thousand years and then we might think of something to do. And that's the same for flowers, for gardens, for things that grow and die, disappear, evanescent. That's the word. Remember it, it's a powerful word. It's a very powerful and beautiful word that you can add to your active vocabulary bank. But that's not the last word, of course. The next word is also a beautiful word. It is gravitate. G-R-A-V-I-T-A-T-E. Gravitate. Let's remember how we use that in context. We said their friendship, of course, we're talking about Celia and Child, their friendship blossomed when he and his wife gravitated to her family's hotel on Appledore. So my question is, which word or words could best replace gravitated in this context? Could we replace it with were discouraged, became attracted, were forced, or moved? Which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back to talk a little bit more about this word. Now, for those of you who thought became attracted is the best answer, you're absolutely right. If you gravitate towards a particular place, thing, or activity, you're attracted by it and go to it or get involved in it. And that's exactly what happened when Child and his wife gravitated to her family's, to Celia's family's hotel on Appledore. So that is our word, gravitate, another beautiful word that you can add to your active vocabulary bank. And now let's move to the next word, one of my favorite words of all time, muse, M-U-S-E. Now, how do we use that in context? We said Thaxter became the young artist's devoted friend, muse, and mentor. So when you are someone's muse, what does that mean? A muse can be best explained as what? As a captive? as an opponent, as a student, or as a guiding spirit. So, which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back to talk a little bit more about this word. Now, for those of you who thought guiding spirit is the best way to explain muse, you're absolutely right. Now, of course, this word originates from Greek mythology, and we had nine muses, and those muses were specialized in different things, some for poetry, for music, etc., but they gave inspiration to writers, to musicians, to artists. And the word carried on. Now, of course, now when we say muse, we don't necessarily refer to Greek mythology, but we're talking about a guiding spirit. A muse is someone who gives an artist ideas or a desire to create art, poetry, or music. That is a muse. Now, if you ask writers, musicians, or artists about their muse, or their muses, actually, it doesn't have to be one person, they may tell you his wife, a person he loves, or somebody he looks up to. So for the case of Child, Celia was not his lover or his wife, but she was definitely someone he looks up to, he learned a lot from. Her wisdom and friendship inspired a lot of art in the back then young artist. So that is the meaning of muse. And now we still have a couple of words we need to talk about. So don't go anywhere. The next word we're going to talk about is render. R-E-N-D-E-R. Render. Let's remember how we use that in context. We said in England, he responded. And he again, of course, we're talking about child. When he went to Europe, we were talking about his trip to Europe. So. He responded to the masterful rendering of atmosphere in the landscapes of J.M.W. Turner, and in Paris, he embraced the sense of sunshine and fresh air portrayed by the Impressionists. So what is a rendering? A rendering can be best explained as what? As an interpretation? As a disappearance? As a historical chronicle? 
or as a decline? So, which do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back to talk a little bit more about this word. Now, for those of you who thought interpretation is the right answer, you're absolutely right. Because that's what a rendering is. To render something, especially in the context of art, you interpret it using your own artistic vision rather than copying it as it is. So it's not just about copying things like a photograph. Not at all. You are rendering the thing. You're using your artistic senses or your artistic vision to show people what you see with your artist's eye. So that's not exactly like taking a photo. Although, of course, I will have to say that taking a photo is an art on its own, but it's a different type of art. But here, when we talk about painting, it's a different story, especially when we talk about Impressionism. And maybe that's interesting. Maybe we'll talk about that one day, but not for today, of course. Today, we're talking about Celia Thaxter and Child Hassam, and we reach this word, rendering or render. And that's definitely not the last word. We still have a couple of words to go. And the next word is somber. S-O-M-B-E-R. Somber. Now let's remember how we use that in context. We said whether producing somber canvases of rainy Boston streets or animated oils of New York's Union Square, Hassan created a hybrid impressionism, a sort of compromise between the careful drawing he had learned from engraving and the lush, bold feel of the modern French tradition. So the word is obviously somber. And remember, somber canvases of rainy Boston streets. Something that is somber can be best described as what? As sophisticated? As revolutionary? As gloomy and dark? Or as bright and cheerful? Which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back to talk a little bit more about this word. Now, for those of you who thought gloomy and dark is the right answer, you're absolutely right. If someone is somber, they are serious or sad. We can use that for colors or places. Somber colors and places are dark and dull. Now, it doesn't have to be dull in the case of child's paintings, because what he did was intentional, actually. The somber canvases of rainy Boston streets. These are dark. These are gloomy. These are sad. But that was not the only thing. Of course, there was a great variety in Hassam's work. And that's actually what we could see in his rendering of Celia's garden and the island. But anyway, that was our word, somber. And our next word is hybrid. And we use this word in the same context. But hybrid, how do we spell this word first? We spell it H-Y-B-R-I-D. Hybrid. Now, let me remind you again, we said whether producing somber canvases of rainy Boston streets or animated oils of New York's Union Square, Hassam created a hybrid impressionism. Hybrid. A sort of compromise between the careful drawing he had learned from engraving and the lush, bold feel of the modern French tradition. So, the word is hybrid. So, my question is, hybrid can be best explained as what? As artificial? as of mixed origin or composition, as permanent, or as unappealing? Which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back to talk a little bit more about hybrid. Now, for those of you who thought a hybrid can be best explained as of mixed origin or composition, you're absolutely right. You can use hybrid to refer to anything that is a mixture of other things, especially two other things. Now, the most famous use of this word is for animals or plants. A hybrid is an animal or plant that has been bred from two different species of animal or plant. Like the mule, for example, is a hybrid of a donkey and a horse. The offspring of a donkey and a horse is a mule. So the mule is a hybrid, not pure breed, not horse alone, and not donkey alone. And here, of course, we're not talking about animal in Hassam's work. We're talking about this hybrid of two different schools. The careful drawing of the engraving school and the lush and bold feel of the modern French tradition, or of course, the Impressionist movement. So that was our word hybrid. And now we come to the very last word for today's episode. And this word is scintillating. And you have to pay attention to the spelling of this word because it's a little bit tricky. It is S-C-I-N-T-I-L-L-A-T-I-N-G. Scintillating. Now let's remember how we use that word in context and then I will ask you the question. 
From Thaxter's accounts of individual plans to her scintillating description of her all-out war against slugs, she captured her garden's brilliant hues and her island's wild beauty. So, the word is scintillating, right? Which word or words could best replace scintillating in this context? Could we replace it with difficult to understand, lively and witty, boring, or technical? So, which do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back to talk a little bit more about this last word for today's episode, scintillating. Now, for those of you who thought lively and witty are the best words to replace scintillating in this context, you're absolutely right. A scintillating conversation or performance is very lively and interesting. Brilliant, exciting, stimulating, lively. These are the words that you can think of when you want to remember the meaning of scintillating. And this is a great word you can use to add variety to the same words you use over and over again. Now, you may be using brilliant, exciting, lively all the time, which is good. But how about throwing scintillating here and there to add variety and richness, especially to your writing? Now, maybe using it in your conversation would sound a little bit pretentious, but it depends who you're talking to. Maybe you want to impress someone, right? If you want to impress someone, go ahead and use scintillating, or definitely you can use it to enrich your writing. And with this word, we come to the last word I wanted to share with you today. And let's remember again, these were 10 words we talked about. We talked about collaboration, profusion, distill, evanescent, gravitate, muse, render, somber, hybrid, and finally, scintillating. So I hope you like the words I shared with you today And I hope you enjoyed the context. I hope you enjoyed the story of Celia Thaxter and Child Hassam. I will have to remind you again that if you want to take it a step further, if you want to take these words and add them to your active vocabulary bank, all you have to do is practice. And I got you covered. I have all the practice you need in this custom post I created for this episode on my website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. You can find the link in the show notes. And when you go there, when you are on the website, you will find that there are two versions of practice. There's one for those of you who prefer digital practice that you just want to do on your PC, on your mobile phone, on your tablet. You don't want anything to do with pen and paper, and that's fine. You can find a version of that on the website. You can do it right on the website. Or for those of you who prefer pen and paper, there's the PDF practice worksheet that you can download, print out, and practice not only the 10 words from today's episode, but also the words from the previous four Word Power episodes. You can find all that in this custom post that you can find the link of in the description of this episode and in the description of the episode you'll also find a link to my patreon page where you can go there become a patron and get access to all the premium content all the premium episodes now the video series starting this week of course you can watch the series those video series on youtube and you can find the words that i highlight here and there in the videos But if you are patrons, you will get extra. You will get more than that. You will get a PDF practice worksheet, but that's not everything, of course. You will get digital practice of the words, and that's not all, of course. There's also a chance for you to share your thoughts because I will have questions for discussion, which is very important if you really want to be active in your learning. So if you want this benefit, you can get this benefit as well if you become a patron on Patreon. So what are you waiting for? Take your learning to the next level by becoming a patron on Patreon. And of course, by doing that, you will also be supporting me, supporting this podcast. And I like to think about it as a win-win situation for me and for you. Now, with that being said, I would like to thank you very much for listening to another episode from English Plus Podcast. This is your host, Danny. I will see you next time. 